and there's uh, correlation. Correlations are being developed between uh, the data that indicates hydrogen and uh, the very dark places at the poles where where uh, uh, research has been done to show that there are places that are permanently dark. Uh, so the moon the moon holds a definite place in, in our understanding of, of our history and potentially our future. Asteroids are a, a, an item of interest. Uh, there are there are large numbers of asteroids. There there are, um, as of uh, 298, there are 458 near uh, uh, near objects identified. Um, where that in number is increasing all the time. Uh, within them. this shows just the distance from the sun and the fact that um, most of them occur outside of the Mars orbit. But there are still significant numbers uh, within Mars orbit, and and these objects hold the interest. Uh, and, and some of the history that I described from the moon, they are also uh, they also have in a, have within them uh, information that relates to our solar system and its history. Both the moon and, and asteroids are talked about for commercial purposes as well, and whether or not those are real at this point remains to be seen. But they uh, hold. Uh, some interest in, in those arenas. There are other possibilities uh, for future exploration. Um, there is a thought that, that um, we could get uh, more information about the outer reaches um, or the farthest reaches that we can that we can sense of the universe and phased array telescopes at Solar L1 are a possibility and, and something that scientists are now talking about. Uh, this is just a concept that shows uh, phased array telescopes being serviced by um, a, a different form of space station uh, that, that could go out there and, and people that would service this type of capability. So there, there's a, there are a lot of things that can be done. There, there, there are, uh, there's a lot of interest, and this is just a very brief description of it, but there's a lot to be done uh, within our solar system so what is what is NASA looking at the uh, what's being discussed right now is is a, a long-range vision that would uh, look at different phases of exploration in space uh, the farthest reaching uh, capabilities would be developed by these telescopes that I just described uh, we've learned uh, more about the universe with Hubble than we, than we knew uh, before it existed, and, and the possibilities for uh, looking out further than the public can look um, brings with it no telling what discoveries. So the idea is to is to move forward in that arena and push technology to the point where we reach as far as we can, and we look for planets that may be like Earth around other stars. The next phase, or the next uh, the next range of capabilities, have to do with robotic spacecraft, where we're uh, working to uh, develop spacecraft that reach to the uh, planets of our solar system, to their moons, to uh, get more in-depth knowledge than we can get from remote sensing. And then uh, the innermost capability is, is the arena in which we can send people to get the, the most in-depth knowledge that, that can be obtained by actually going there and, and doing first-hand um, science and discovery. Within human spaceflight, we're looking at our future in, in these terms where we feel that an important part of our job is to bring back this knowledge to, to uh, work with the science community and, and bring back the knowledge they're interested in as it relates to life in the solar system, the uh, climatic change. We're also interested in, interested in, the, in the science uh, associated with uh, people living and working in space for long periods of time. Uh, that is another part of the expanding knowledge that we can that we can go after. We are interested at this point um, in the time frame where we're building space station and at developing capabilities that will allow us to do missions beyond Earth orbit in the future. And so, uh, some of the capabilities that are being looked at are shown in the bottom part of the chart, where we are looking at, uh, to be able to live off the land as we go out. Uh, from Earth orbit, we are looking to develop uh, commercial opportunities to help uh, help enable uh, missions of exploration in the future. We're always interested in the safety of when we the 
safety of missions when we send people. And uh, a, a, a very uh, strong um, uh, emphasis is always placed on keeping the cost down. And, and, and we have to, as we move out in the future, uh, get the cost down of human space flight. And that will have to be done in order to enable these types of missions. We have been working over the last two and a half years to uh, develop a, a, a combined strategy uh, between human spaceflight and the science community and the robotic, uh, those who uh, build robotic spacecraft to come up with an integrated approach to exploration in the future. And uh, we have begun that. Uh, we are, I'll, I'll describe some of, the, uh, some of the facets of that as we go forward. We have worked uh, primarily at this point in, uh, in, uh, in the planning efforts uh, for Mars missions. We have uh, worked with JPL in particular in uh, developing joint objectives for the Mars missions as they're going. Uh, we, um, we basically got energized uh, within NASA uh, in the human side of uh, exploration. Once again, after after the uh, Mars meteorite was found, and at that time, uh, the 2001 mission was in the planet. It's just beginning its planning phase. So uh, we did uh, work with uh, with scientists and, and JPL in developing objectives for in future human space flight um, in the 2001 mission. I'll talk to that in more detail. We have also worked with them in, the, in possibilities for 2003 and 2005. The 2001 mission includes um, human, uh, human space flight or, or heads, what we call heads objectives, the human exploration and development of space. Uh, this spacecraft, along with the science objectives, is going to have experiments that measure, um, that measure radiation on the surface. The orbiter will also have radiation measurements so we can understand the uh, effects of the Mars atmosphere on the galactic cosmic radiation in particular, and as well as uh, solar, uh, solar flare uh, related radiation. We, um, we will have on it an experiment that will, uh, called the MIP experiment, that will, um, that will test uh, certain processes in the Mars environment for making oxygen out of CO2 environment, as well as um, understanding radiator technology uh, a little better in, in getting that refined. Uh, looking at solar um, cell uh, technology and in the dust environment, and uh, so, um, and we also have an important experiment in, in looking at Martian so soil and dust so that we can understand the possible toxic effects, the possible effects of um, the, of um, uh, it's. it's uh, uh, oxidizing characteristics. We are we are working with JPL on the guidance uh, as uh, the Mars as this Mars lander uh, goes into the Mars atmosphere and refining uh, the algorithms so that we get closer to more precise landings in these missions. Actually, uh, the work that's gone on there on that has completed various uh, various uh, guidance approaches, and the one selected was actually a. a uh, a modification of the Apollo guidance. This is uh, a, a, an ours concept of the of the 2001 lander, and I'll, uh, uh, it has on its on its deck uh, some of the experiments that I talked about, as well as um, uh, an arm for gathering up dirt, uh, 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 a stereo uh, camera and other experiments. The MIP experiment is uh, fully under development. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a picture of the development unit. It's actually, uh, this is an actual, actually pretty much almost like a flight unit. It's uh, very close in, in all of its details uh, from the uh, oxygen generation um, aspects of it to the solar cell, um, to the solar cell um, Experiment as well as the radiator experiment, and um, just recently it's gone through uh, environmental chamber test, um, 
And these were done at Johnson Space Center. This is a picture that shows it in the, in, in the Mars chamber. It's a very small box. It's smaller than the uh, podium here. Uh, this just this small part of the podium on top of the table. This shows the uh, MIP experiment totally uh, bundled up and, and as it would look on, on the Mars lander. So this is under development. It's just gone through its critical design review this last week. Um, the, uh, the qualification units uh, are, are in development and uh, the flight units uh, will shortly follow. So it's on a track as well as the other uh, experiments that are of interest to human, human space flight are under development on the way. So there is actual work going on, um, and, and the importance of this for human space flight is that we will learn uh, about more about the environment as it relates to people on Mars. We will learn more about the design parameters that we have to deal with in, um, when we design human space flight, spacecraft. Uh, as we do that, we like to reduce the uh, uncertainties in that design so that we can save cost and we can make them uh, more efficient and lighter. Um, this, this chart shows, um, and some of you may have seen this in other presentations, but it shows the basic Mars architecture from, uh, beyond 2001, where in 2003 and 2005, um, landers are proposed with uh, rovers that will collect samples for return to Earth. The, um, the um, uh, French are participating and the A5 that's shown on one rocket is, um, is an Ariane 5. Uh, they're also proposing uh, an orbiter which they would build in 2005. And what um, what this how the, the way this program is currently laid out is there would be a, a small rocket on the lander that would take samples that were collected by the rovers. And uh, in 2003 and 2005, they both launch uh, samples into orbit that would then in 2005 be collected by the Mars orbiter, which would uh, then propel a small entry capsule back to Earth and uh, either one or two capsules that would contain the samples. And, and as Carl Allen described in the last presentation, would land in Utah. What are we doing out beyond that? Well, uh, we are working with the uh, with the uh, with the folks at JPL currently on, on possible um, outpost missions. This is um, a very brief chart that just shows what it might, it might be like at Mars. We currently have the uh, small spacecraft that go there uh, through the Mars Surveyor Program, and it's it's thought that uh, there's a there's a unique possibility of, of sending spacecraft in, um, on a range of different launch vehicles that could augment add to the science capabilities as well as uh, possibly in place human uh, asset assets for human missions on, on some of these flights uh, before we talk, even talk about um, larger launch vehicles so um, there are some there are some very interesting missions that can be looked at in that arena. Uh, we've primarily just done some brainstorming at this point. These are some ideas of what they might be. Um, I don't think we would ever do all of them, uh, perhaps, but but there are there are some that are very interesting from landing uh, large drills with uh, with appropriate power sources that could uh, dig to depths and, and possibly look for uh, water uh, under the uh, under the under the bar soil. Um, we uh, are also looking at the possibilities for separate modules uh, for labs. Uh, when people go there, we could set down rovers that could be used for both science and for transporting humans when they get there. So that uh, this would be a larger, a larger capability than currently is flown. Uh, we could send uh, uh, in situ resource plants that could uh, that could fully develop develop fuels for for uh, spacecraft. Uh, either for sample return or for uh, human missions uh, beyond that. And we've grouped them, we've begun to group them in, in according to capabilities of the possible launch vehicles. And, um, and, uh, and this work is actually just beginning, but it is a, a range of possibilities that is being looked at. In terms of, I, I talked um, 
right up front about the possibility of, of going various places, uh, whether it's Mars, the Moon, asteroids, solar L1. We're looking at capabilities that would allow any one of those uh, eventualities, depending on the uh, interest, whether it be commercial or scientific exploration related uh, in the future. Um, we have looked at some, some specifics in this arena. Um, we have looked at the possibility of, of using solar electric uh, propulsion to get large spacecraft out to very high Earth orbits where you can then uh, use small chemical stages to go on to uh, the final destination. And if you, if you approach uh, the space uh, travel in this, in this fashion, the, uh, the capabilities uh, are not a lot different from, from going to any of these locations. Uh, we would not send the crew up for a year's worth of spiraling out uh, as it would take for these big cargo missions. Uh, we'd send them up in smaller vehicles uh, just before they would be sent uh, to onto Mars or, or wherever. What this might look like, um, we, have, we have started with the possibility of a, a larger launch vehicle that would be based on, on the technology that would be applicable to shuttle upgrades, uh, whether uh, including flyback boosters, uh, tanks that are on the, on the same diameter as an external tank for the shuttle. Uh, we've looked at the possibility of using the launch shroud as the entry vehicle at Mars uh, for aero braking. So um, that, that's what this depicts. Th this kind of operation doesn't occur all in one frame, but uh, it just kind of gives you an idea of what the, the various pieces might look like. The solar electric. Uh, stage uh, would take would then uh, be mated with um, with the habitat, for instance, uh, for the Mars uh, crew, and this habitat would would gradually spiral out using electric propulsion potentially uh, at about the one megawatt size range, and this spacecraft would gradually spiral out from low Earth orbit to higher Earth orbit over a period of uh, approximately a year. Once it's out there, we would bring the crew up and, and uh, transfer them to this uh, vehicle that, that then would transfer on the Mars for the chemical stage. And these, these are all uh, just in the, this, these are in the conceptual stage, and, and we have looked at uh, a, a wide range of possibilities for these types of missions in the past. But this is one that we've spent a lot of time on the last approximately year. Once we get to Mars, we would we would air break into into Mars, and, and for a lander, uh, we we would uh, we would bring it uh, to Mars the same way. We would leave uh, the transfer vehicle in orbit for the crew and land uh, them on the surface using parachute chutes and final finally uh, rocket engines for the final uh, break. And of course. The important part of the mission is not just uh, hardware, it's, it's the things that you do when you get there. And I, I talked a little bit about those possibilities. We are creating, um, working with the science community and defining what, uh, what we call uh, reference scenarios on the surface are. Uh, so we would, we would begin, we're beginning to get, a, uh, get an idea of the operations on the surface uh, once we get there. The trip home, the crew would go back into orbit, would uh, transfer to the uh, to the uh, transfer vehicle for the trip home, and, and it potentially could break into into Earth orbit in order to save the uh, spacecraft for future use. So, uh, I've, I've described to you uh, some of the work that's going on, uh, both in uh, our our work with JPL for for uh, the science missions that are currently underway. I've talked to you a little bit about uh, some of the work going on in mission planning, which is something that we do nonstop. It's going on all the time, looking at different ideas uh, that come in, uh, trying different approaches. Another important aspect of what needs to be done right now in, in the time frame where when we're um, building space station is investing in technologies that will be a benefit in the future. For, uh, we need them for Mars missions, we need them for missions beyond Earth orbit. We need a, a number of them to, uh, to bring more efficiency to the programs that we have. 
because Shuttle Station can benefit from a lot of the technologies that we might develop in the future. So we're looking at technology in, in that, uh, in that uh, from that standpoint or that perspective, and and we're are working toward influencing NASA's technology programs to address those types of technologies. We've uh, we've looked at very um, uh, several critical factors in, in identifying technologies. Um, uh, the first and third have to do with risk, health, and safety. Those are always important when we send people. Uh, they're important for their current missions, and, and it's something that you hear about associated with human missions all the time. Basic performance is incredibly important for affording these missions in the future, uh, from advanced propulsion, from uh, lightweight materials, uh, advanced electronics, uh, going more toward microelectronics and wireless capability, uh, communication between computers, all of these sort of things, any, any technology that adds to efficiencies and brings mass down is, is, is very important to us. We, uh, in human space flight, uh, between the shuttle and station, those programs have been underway for a long time. Shuttle began in the early 70s, uh, right after Apollo, and was based uh, largely on Apollo technology. There were, there were some new technologies like the tiles, uh, the main engines, that were uh, pacers for the program. Uh, the space station uh, began its phase B environment. Uh, it's, it's, it's the beginning of its development in 1984. So the technologies that we are flying in human space flight are, are in a lot of ways, uh, uh, primarily from the 60s and 70s, and, and some from the 80s. But in the future, as we go to places like Mars, the effects of, of mass on the efficiency of your mission are much more important than they ever were in going to Earth orbit. The, uh, the masses, and, and when you look at masses going to Mars, and, and for, as an example, if you, if you send one pound to, all the way to the Mars surface and then bring it all the way back, including the astronauts, uh, it costs you 40 pounds in lower orbit uh, in terms of fuel engines, tanks, and so on, and the systems that support them. That's in lower Earth orbit. It takes much more than that to get it off, off of Earth. So the, the multiplying factors and the leverage of mass on, the, on, on what it takes to do one of these missions is incredibly important to us. So going more toward lightweight uh, structures than we have in the past, and going to new technologies that are in development currently outside of NASA, even, and microelectronics, nano, nanos technology um, are, are, are very important to us. In the arena of human health and safety, um, we are, we are uh, still having to address and still must address the, um, the technologies associated with radiation protection. Uh, once we get away from the Earth, um, um, the Earth's magnetic field, we're more subject to, to uh, galactic cosmic radiation. And, um, and we're also um, having to deal with, as time goes on, more time in, in, in low gravity unless we do eventually go to a uh, rotating spacecraft where we, where we create a, a, a gravity field. Um, these are important to us. Another aspect of this, which hasn't been talked about a lot in the past, is the idea of medical care and diagnostics. In Earth orbit, uh, where we've spent most of the last um, uh, 20, 25 years with people, um, we all, we've always had the ability and we will continue to have the ability to bring people home in a moment's notice. If we have a severe in, uh, injury or, or medical, um, or, or, or an astronaut gets uh, severely sick, we can, we'll always have the ability to bring them home. When we go on a Mars mission, we're going to be gone for a thousand days, approximately. And once you leave Earth orbit, you're on your way, and and uh, you better have with you what you need. So I, it, it's going to be important in the future that we have better, more lightweight uh, medical diagnostics for injuries and, and sicknesses, as well as medical care. And uh, there there is there are ideas being developed in that arena. Um, talk about mass. Um, there are things uh, in the arena of basic performance that are important. Uh, just to be able to go 
closed loop life support systems. Um, some of the some of the transportation technologies are, are important uh, in order to be able to get to the even in the range of the right right masses or the right size uh, space movements. So in the we are trying to influence NASA's programs and, and are becoming more successful as time goes on. We're also working pretty hard to to uh, leverage existing programs that are flying. Uh, we're we're uh, looking at shuttle and station programs for opportunities to upgrade their technologies, to test out technologies that we need for the long range. Um, I already mentioned the the work that we're doing with the science community and and uh, developing objectives for robotic missions. Uh, so we are trying to get technology tested in the proper environments. We are trying to test technologies that we will need in the future. And it, it, it will be important to do this because as we go on, as, once again, as we go on these trips that may last a thousand days, these systems are going to have to be highly reliable. Uh, where the big uh, challenge in, in the space station program is the assembly, the challenge for a Mars mission is going to be reliability because once again, there's no what you, you go with, you go with what you're able to take, and so there's no up, up, uh, mass uh, along the way for uh, logistics and, and replacement units for things that, that break. So is, if if we can begin to test technologies and hardware in uh, in uh, in the space station, for instance. Uh, over long periods of time, we get time on them. Uh, if you remember the shuttle program, uh, when we first started flying the shuttle, we had problems. Uh, the second flight came back early because of fuel cell problems. We had a series of problems that we dealt with. It takes time in, in using a system to work the bugs out. So anything that we can do in that regard on ongoing missions and current capabilities will uh, help enable what we can do in the future. We are uh, one of the big areas, uh, just I'll throw out a couple of examples, things that have been done and are being worked on. Uh, we've had uh, fairly extensive testing on advanced life support systems that are beyond where we are in space station, where we are uh, actually closing the loop, fully closing the loop. We had a crew in a chamber uh, for 90 days at, at Johnson Space Center uh, last year, and it, they, they had fully closed air and water loops. And this, uh, this, this uh, hardware that was used for this uh, were engineering units of what we would use on, potentially on the Mars mission. We actually had a, a proposal in, in underway to uh, get this, this hardware on space station in place of, the, of this current system. And it couldn't quite get there, so um, we do hope to apply it as replacement units uh, in the future. Another idea that you, you may have very likely have heard about is the idea of uh, what's called transhab. And it, it's uh, a concept for applying inflatable modules. Um, it's, it, uh, the, the first approach to this would be to uh, apply uh, a module up in the space shuttle that would be compacted, uh, would be trussed up, and, um, and where it can fit in the cargo bay, the uh, cargo bay being about 15 feet in diameter. The, um, once it got on orbit, it could, uh, would then be deployed and inflated and would be on the order of, say, 23 to 25 feet in diameter, about 30 feet long. We're, we're working on this to uh, try and get this to, uh, on the space station to replace the current cab module design. Um, just to give you some of the details, um, it, it, it's an inflatable uh, structure where it has a, has a, uh, a hard core uh, carbon fiber primarily in the, in the uh, center uh, structure. It's, it's what supports the inflatable uh, at, uh, part of the skin. It has with hard mounted on this hard structure the systems, the, the line runs for fluid systems as well as uh, wire runs for electronics and, and power. The uh, primary structure involved in this is, is a woven Kevlar with about one inch straps that are woven together to form the structural restraint layer. Inside of this, there are very thin membranes that, that are shown on the, on the circle up here. 
that uh, that, are, that actually hold the pressure, and they and they basically inflate so they they fetch up against the Kevlar, and uh, therefore and they're redundant bladders so that they uh, maintain pressure. Of course, the first thing that you worry about with something that's inflated is getting a puncture. So, um, which was my first concern uh, when it was uh, initially discussed. There's a, a very unique uh, and innovative design that's been put together for protecting this, uh, this structure. And it, and it has to do with uh, a fabric called Nextel. It's, it, it's, a, it's a material that's good for, for uh, meteorite debris uh, um, uh, coming in and, and penetrating. And, but the, the primary value in using it is to get separation distance between it and the structure that you're trying to protect. And, and, and this Nextel material is used in the current space station design between the outer aluminum skin and the inner aluminum skin. So it, it's, it's something that has been in work for some time. So in this design, because we have the whole outer structure and inflated structure collapsed, um, this is also collapsed and it is a fabric. Um, it is separated by layers of foam, which act as a spring. So as the module is inflated, the foam then pushes the next L layers out to their separation distances. And whereas uh, the space station modules, as designed, have about a six-inch buffer uh, region, this um, this design would have a, at least a foot of a separation. So it, it, it has uh, very high protective capabilities. participatory 
experience for people all around the world. Other discoveries uh, have been made through Clementine and Lunar Prospector. We learned, we've learned a fair amount about the moon that we didn't know after sending six people there. There's probably more to learn uh, if, if, we'd only, if, if we only knew about the new world, what Columbus brought back in his voyages, we wouldn't know very much about it. The same is true of what we know about the moon from the Apollo astronauts going there. So there is still a lot to be learned. There is, it's all relevant to, to the Earth's history and its future. And uh, our challenge is to come up with an approach or approaches at, the, at, at exploring space, at exploring our solar system that are efficient, that are, that are of, of, of compelling interest to the public, and that we, we definitely that we can afford. And um, uh, it's up to us to see if we're up to it. And that's what I've prepared, and I'd be glad to answer questions.
Yes, in fact, um, the question had to do with, with if you couldn't hear it, um, had to do with are we looking at commsats and, and an infrastructure at Mars uh, for these missions? That's actually being looked at and studied and has had money applied to it for uh, the revival uh, ahead of human missions. So um, it's 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 of definite interest. The fact that it's becoming more possible makes it even more of interest. Um, We've had people out on, on terrestrial um, exploration activities um, where they're looking at approaches, operational techniques for gathering science information. And, and one of the first things that happened uh, in, in one of these is somebody pulled out a little GPS receiver and uh, he had located a spot they wanted to drill. And, and you know, that makes immediate sense to, to locate your possible finds of uh, interesting locations. Uh, so, um, those are tremendous tools for when you get into the actual science operations and, and, and are, are operating on the surface. So, yes, they're look, being looked at seriously. Uh, it's also inevitable that we'll want to uh, get as much bandwidth as we can for bringing back information, uh, bringing back not only data to the scientists, but bringing back the experience of people here on Earth. And as technology improves, that could be more virtual than it ever has been in the past. So I think we want to push those technologies and, and really bring back the, this idea of, of the, the excitement of discovery to people here on Earth. Yes. Um, there's one in development. Um, and, uh, we've gone through a few gyrations, and, and, and um, uh, NASA's working on it. Uh, a coordinated set of websites. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.